Please welcome Professor Collins. Thank you so much, Don. Um, it's really a pleasure for me to be with you here today. I, many of you have, as Don mentioned, heard the sabbatical report that I gave a couple, well, it's been two and a half years ago now. And uh, some of what the material that I'll share with you today is a bit redundant to that. Uh, but the goal that I have for us today is to develop a big picture perspective and I hope that we can accomplish that. Right near the end of our time today, we'll be talking a little bit about the content of Random Designer, and I'll give you an introduction into the main messages that I would like to accomplish and the goals that I'd like to accomplish as well. Uh, but then it really is going to uh, serve then as a springboard for our discussion next time where we'll really begin to get into some of the meat of what's involved in Random Designer uh, definitions of random design, what its potential is for interacting effectively in our culture today. So uh, please bear with me, those of you who have seen some of these pictures before, but I'd like to go ahead and, and share with you some of the amazing things that I'm discovering about life. I want to share with you some of the thoughts that I have. Uh, random design is one of the most provocative ideas I think that I've ever experienced in my years as a scientist. It first began to come to me a number of years ago, approximately maybe 15, and uh, I'll talk to you a little bit about that. I want to tell you just, uh, first of all, however, a little bit about myself. Most of you know that I'm a scientist, microbiologist, and like 90% of other Americans, I am also a theist. You see, I believe that God is real, and I believe that science is his tool to help us discover his created nature. And I'm fully aware that there are some people who simply don't think that the term Christian and science can go together. I understand that. I was visiting my son's Sunday school class down in Lynchburg, Virginia a year or so ago, and in the course of the conversation, uh, it came to light that I was a scientist and that I taught at a Christian university. And we discussed some general things during the course of the class, but it was interesting to me that at the end of the class, there was this young lady in the back of the classroom who had a little child on her lap, a mother. And she said, I'm just so glad that Dr. Colling was able to be with us today. She said, I had always heard that there were scientists who were also Christians. But I had never met one. <laughs> um, and then, uh, some of you know the article feature in the Wall Street Journal that came out in December. The tremendous feedback. I mean, I was just bombarded with emails and letters from all over the world, literally, uh, overnight. The thing that really stood out in my mind, though, was the mindset. The thing that caught people's attention wasn't random design, and they didn't see the, the bigger messages I was trying to convey. The thing that was most amazing to them was that you could be a Christian and a scientist at the same time. Same thing. Interesting. Well, as you'll begin to see as we share some time together, you'll see that I disagree with this characterization, and I believe that science and faith are fully compatible. In fact, they have to be. My formal training in biology now is 32 years with a professional specialty in microbiology. Now, I could attempt to tell you what a microbiologist is, but I can make it pretty simple. If you're looking at something that's alive or something that's a part of something living and you're interested in those types of things, I could tell you far more probably than you would ever want to know, especially if you can't see it. Small things like genes, cells, viruses, proteins, those types of things. For the last 24 years, I've been a professor here at Olivet teaching talented and committed Christian students about the molecular nature of life. At these unseen levels of life, I find myself continually amazed at the incredible order and logic that exists within the midst of our cells, an intricate maze of structure, design, and purpose. There were times I can remember in Read 075, standing in front of a classroom, and as I was speaking to 
excuse me, as I was speaking to the students about the molecular nature of life, I literally felt chills running up and down my spine. You can sort of picture it. I'm talking to them about the details at the same time I'm feeling the chills as I gl get a glimpse of the beauty and the wonder that's present there. Over many years, I've gradually developed insights and perspectives into the living world that I never could have imagined 25 or 30 years ago. In my view, no one who has glimpsed life at this level can deny that we are indeed fearfully and wonderfully made. In my view, the religious impl implications of such exquisite creations are absolutely inescapable. Nevertheless, in our society today, the rancor that continues between science and faith continues unabated. <clears throat> I'll come back to this slide a little bit later on. And there are lots of parameters that go into this question. This is a distillation. Anyone who understands uh, and gets into the issues of science and faith quickly discover that it's not an easy solution. This looks like an easy solution. This isn't the whole story. But it's, I think, sort of a distillation of that. Bottom line, scientists are suspicious that Christians want to insert religious beliefs into science. This is an idea that in the scientific community is absolutely abhorrent to them. They're afraid of that because they want the world to be governed in rational ways and they, want, they have seen too many examples of religion infringing upon that. But on the other hand, Christians fear that science seeks to remove God from the picture altogether. That fear is not unjustified. We had a speaker in chapel just last Thursday who quoted Richard Dawkins, one of the most world-renowned uh, atheistic evolutionary scientists who said, if natural law creates, then there was nothing for God to do. Those types of statements are beyond the boundaries of science. And we'll come back and talk about these things a little bit later on. By the early 1990s, I think that I was already beginning to, to become aware that someone needed to write a book like Random Designer. Someone who would relate an honest and credible version of the miracle of life while at the same time affirming God to be directly in the center of the overall portrait. But honestly, I must tell you that I felt like Moses in the wilderness, and I did not want to be the one. There were many books written about the integration of science and faith from a physical scientist standpoint, lots of them out there since the 80s. And people were beginning to come to peace with those concepts, but when you talk about biology and evolution, all of a sudden it hit home. And that's what people care about. You see, biology professors at Christian colleges are keenly aware that landmines abound for anyone who dares to speak authoritatively about matters of science and faith. Surely someone else could do it, God. But at the risk of seeming a bit mystical, and those of you who know me know that I'm sort of a nuts and bolts type of guy, I want to ask you this question. Do you believe that God still speaks today? Most of my Christian brothers and sisters would say yes. But do you really believe that he will guide us if we ask him and if we pray and we seek his direction? I understand that some people think that such a thought is sort of a repugnant idea. Last fall during the presidential election, you all remember President Bush came under incredible public uh, disdain and criticism because he said something so simple as, I pray every day and I seek God's guidance in the decisions that I make. And I believe that he guides